Thank you. OK, um, it's pretty cool to be here. Um, my name is Hao Li. And uh, as opposed to most people here, I'm actually a uh, professor in computer science at the University of Southern California. And also recently, I just started a company called Pinscreen. So I'll talk about that later. All right. So the talk today is about uh, bridging physical and digital worlds in VR. And I'm a uh, professor in computer science, and especially in the field of computer graphics and computer vision. So when you think about computer graphics, the first thing that comes to your mind is probably computer animations, computer games, or VFX. But the question is, what is actually the future? So the nice thing is, and I guess uh, pretty much every one of you agrees with me, that 2014 has been the year of immersive experiences, uh, which there has been a survey where people said that they would rather spend uh, their money more on immersive experiences rather than on material items. All right, so what does it have to do with graphics? Well, if we take a step back, um, you know, back in the 80s, uh, people have thought about, like, you know, we wanted to live in an alternate reality where everything would be digital, something like as if you would live in the matrix, right? And it's not that of a science fiction, right? We're not that far away from it. And the reason are twofold. Um, first of all, um, you know, obviously, with Oculus VR, um, people have basically democratized the um, development of high-resolution, high-quality displays, so you can get them at really low cost. And the second thing that's really important is that you can basically generate high-end computer graphics in real time, right? So basically, if you have things that run in real time, you can render everything from arbitrary uh, points of views. Now, the question is, what is a research, um, you know, from a research standpoint, what are the challenges, right? So we're focusing on two important things. Well, here's a, just another example of, you know, how low cost it can be. But the question here really is, is VR really just for you know, consumers, right? Are we just um, thinking about uh, VR for you know, playing games and you know, consuming 360 videos, or can we go beyond it? Can we use it as a platform for communication or more, right? So one of the uh, interesting thing here is this is one of the videos that they were showing at Oculus Connect, which is you know, it's a multiplayer game where you can basically interact with your friends remotely or just think about like if you could um, watch a movie together with your friends, right? So one problem you can see here is that these faces are just floating heads. They don't have specific expressions. But if you want real telepresence, you want to have facial expressions in there. So this is sort of like um, one of the collaborations that we've been doing with Oculus. And uh, the idea is really, can you have facial expressions inside this virtual world? Can you be someone else, right? So the question here is, how can you create 3D content? How can you create your digital avatar? And the second thing is, how can you capture your emotions, your body motions, and your facial expressions? Right? So for you know, capturing digital models from the physical world to the digital, you know, there has been a lot of work on that. Um, this is an example of multi-view stereo from computer vision. You place a lot of cameras on the person, and you can capture the body automatically. These are mature technologies. Here's another one of you know, the standard way of capturing motion is you put all these markers. right? Now, this is you know, industry standard. People have been using that, but it's not the way to go. It's not the way you can actually deploy these type of things you know, to the consumers. So this is what we have actually in mind you know, from an academic standpoint, is we want to go there. We want to use the best camera in the world, which is basically your iPhone camera. Right? The idea is, like, can you just like, use your iPhone, film someone, obtain automatically a high-quality digital character, and maybe also create, uh, capture their motions? This is extremely difficult from a computer vision standpoint. So what we'd like to do is basically um, use technologies that are you know, democratized. For example, you know, 3D sensors that you obtain from the Kinect. Microsoft made the first move. Now you have Intel RealSense. This is an example of you know, 3D sensing technology that is basically in your entertainment system. So the nice thing here is that you can basically turn really difficult computer vision problems into a geometric problem that is you know, a lot easier to solve. So I'm going to show you how. So what we do is no longer computer vision, but it's geometry processing. So the idea is basically that the camera sees this type of data, which is just arbitrary, unstructured point clouds that don't have specific semantics to the computer. So what we'd like to do is solve a low-level geometric problem, which is basically you know, how can we fill in holes. You know, there's a lot of optical occlusions, so you can't see the entire mesh. But what you'd like to do is obtain the entire thing from sequences that have been observed. 
And then the second thing is, can we extract semantics? That's the ultimate goal of you know, 3D sensing humans. So if you have both, you, know, you can actually improve each other. And at the core of this problem is a correspondence problem. Right? So basically, um, on the left, you can see basically this is what the computer would observe. But what you should obtain in the end is a complete understanding of what this geometry means. So for humans, it's really easy to you know, recognize where each point would actually go. But for the computer, it's, not very it's very difficult. So one of the algorithms that we have developed in our lab is basically the ability to automatically you know, extract information by, you know, basically re rephrasing this entire problem as a numerical optimization problem, right? So we f solve an energy minimization problem, and we can basically refine one shape to another to extract the semantics. So here's a concrete example. For example, the gray guy is actually one of the guys you would scan. The, gr the green guy is a device template model with all the information in there. And what you do is basically you run this algorithm, and you can automatically extract you know, semanti semantical information such as BMI, pose, gender, et cetera. So these, are, these things have huge applications. For example, in entertainment, you can automatically extract um, body poses for fitness applications, and obviously for the digital garment industry. Here's another example of, you know, with, 3D print, with the emergence of 3D printers, um, you know, obviously, you know, the standard way of scanning people is, you know, you have a person going around the, the other person, and uh, you need a second operator to, um, you know, extract the mesh of that person. So it's really, you know, a tedious process. So one thing we've been thinking about is, can we make this thing more deployable, right? Can we run these things inside the room of you know, an arbitrary person? So we basically develop an algorithm that have to connect, scan multiple views of that person. And what it will do is that you don't even need a turntable. It can actually merge all the views together, and you get this high quality mesh. This is computed fully automatically. You can actually download the software on Shapeify.me, right? So all you need is a connect. OK, so here's a couple of examples of what you can do. You can see the robustness of this algorithm. You can have multiple people, no specific um, priors. You can basically scan you know, arbitrary clothings and props, et cetera. So we were talking about VR. And one of the applications in VR is that you can actually have a digital avatar of yourself um, really easily. right? So all you need is a connect. You place it there. It scans different views of your body. And you have an algorithm that could automatically extract you know, functionalities from this three-dimensional mesh so that you can actually have a um, believable or recognizable character of yourself inside a game. So this is one of the projects that was funded by the military where people wanted to check how people would actually react if you know, some of your buddies would be killed inside a game. Right? So you can see that the entire process is automatic. You can extract um, you know, an animatable character from that person just through scanning. All right, so what we basically do is we're not doing an inside-out acquisition, but most of the times an outside-in application. So here's just a couple of examples what you can do if you have the ability to extract correspondences over time, right? You can fill in holes and create free viewpoint videos. At the core, it's the same algorithm, which is an algorithm that can fuse data even though they are deforming, especially that's a big problem when you have you know, human bodies. Here's an example of uh, what Microsoft have recently done uh, using one of the uh, algorithms we have uh, developed in 2012. Right? So you can get high quality um, you know, human performances from 106 cameras. So one of the research direction we're doing is how to reduce the number of cameras so that these kind of technologies can be deployed um, in the wild. All right. So we've seen bodies, and I'd like to show you some work on faces. So I worked a lot on faces. Before I joined USC, I was uh, working at Industrial Light and Magic. And this is sort of like the pipeline that we were using, right? So you have a digital, you have a human, he has to wear all these markers, and you have a lot of manual work behind creating realistic digital characters. Last year, I was hired at uh, Weta Digital, and we worked on you know, the realistic um, digitization of Paul Walker. Um, he basically just diseased uh, recently in a car accident for Fury 7. So if you, what you don't know is that it takes roughly three weeks 
for only 10 seconds of animation, right? So the entire face is CG. The performance has been captured from his brother and then mapped onto his face. Now, what we do in research is how can we avoid these expensive and costly pipelines by basically replacing something that is markerless and real time. So I'd like to show you one of the um, things that we have developed and have been working on um, more recently, which is basically a way to actually capture your facial performances um, using a 3D sensor. So I have one right here, and you can see right now that it's actually tracking my face, right? So I can, it's actually 3D. So I can turn myself into a monkey and basically do my entire talk through this digital character, right? So I can be a panda bear if you want, right? All right. So. Let me show you a little bit more. Right, so these are like some things that you might have seen in popular media. So this is some work from my colleagues at Stanford. Um, it's based on very similar techniques where you can actually track your face. But you can see the face of the one person is actually mapping to another person. So now you can imagine the implications of you know, what kind of you know, ethical implications of what would happen if you can do these capabilities, right? So these are some of the technologies that we are introducing through um, my company called Pinscreen. Uh, we're basically developing a face tracking framework that actually works on mobile phones. So this is one of the features that you can you know, expect in um, our AR-based company, right? So this is solely based on an iPhone camera. OK, so we we're talking about VR, and what does facial tracking mean in VR? Well, the biggest problem is that your face is being occluded. How can you capture your facial expression even though you're wearing this VR HMD? So one thing that we've developed in collaboration with Oculus is basically a prototype VR HMD where we wanted to demonstrate that it's actually possible to create um, realistic faces. So what we did is basically we mounted a 3D sensor to capture the visible mouth region. And everything that's being occluded, we use contact sensors based on strain gauges to capture the motion. So this is what it looks like. If you wear this HMD on the foam pad, you have eight sensors that are placed sparsely on this foam pad. And it captures different signals. We use machine learning to map these signals onto a realistic facial expression so that his facial expression can be mapped directly onto an, you know, through this HMD device. So we can basically have a face-to-face -face communication in cyberspace. So that was basically the demonstration we wanted to show. Obviously, this is not you know, the best ergonomic solution, but we're working on that. Right? So ultimately, we want to go here. We want to create realistic faces at this quality. So this is a real-time playback, but we like to fill in the hole by bridging the gap of realistic faces. All right, so we've seen bodies, we've seen faces, but a face is nothing without the hair. The hair is a very important biometric feature of the human face, and hair is something that's extremely complex, right? The, the simulation, the, the, anim the motion of the hair is ridiculously complex, as well as the structure itself, because we no longer have what we call, in mathematics, a two-manifold surface. So usually, you know, in animation, um, animate or modelers would actually take you know, roughly a month to create the hair of a hero character. But we're thinking about, like, can we scan hair as well, just like we're scanning surfaces? Well, we're probably one of the only labs in the world to actually develop an algorithm that does that. And we started you know, back in the days looking at you know, the, most, you know, the easiest way to capture these things. So we were basically using a multi-view stereo system. And this is the result of what you would get using you know, multi-view system, multi stereo system to capture the surface of here. So you get a lot of points, a lot of noise. And um, what we figured out is that after several years, we figured out that there are three important priors that you need to include into your multi-view stereo algorithm. First of all, it's the structure of here that you can extract from images. The second thing is low-level geometry priors, right? So basically, if you have groups of hair that would actually you know, group together. And the third thing is physics, right? So if you can extract, if you can define what hair is in a physical sense, you have a much better way of extracting hair. So this is the hair st strand structure that we could actually extract just through optical acquisition. So we put a lot of cameras around the person, and we can basically extract how hair would actually grow. So that actually creates two problems. One is 
you know, you still have this like multi-view stereo capture system. No one has these kind of things at home, but people might have a Kinect at home, right? So you, we might have 3D sensors in our next generation laptops or tablet devices. And the second problem is we're using physical priors to define what hair is, but some things are physically difficult to simulate, such as braided hairstyle or, in a more general sen sense, constrained hairstyles. So we use some stuff in braid theory, right? so that's uh, in mathematics, to basically generate um, you know, the shape of how braid would actually be formed. So we procedurally generate you know, exhaustively different combinations of hair, and brute force create them and use the Markov random field to actually extract the hair model. So this is hair model that is fully automatically digitized from a single connect, right? What we did recently developed is an algorithm that only requires a single image from an iPhone or a random internet picture to extract hair models. So we use a high, um, a large database of hair collections in order to create these type of hairstyles. All right, so let me just quickly summarize you know, what I believe the future is in you know, digitizing human bodies. These things have huge implications, of obviously, in entertainment because it scales production. Consumers are important things that we're looking into, um, especially these are real uh, challenges. More robust algorithms have to be developed. And obviously, we're looking into what are the next um, you know, generation interfaces for communications, um, including in VR. And if you have a sensor that has the ability to recognize or digitize human beings, it possibly might be a bridge to artificial intelligence. Thank you very much.